It's his end of fifth, by the way. Did I swear? Yeah, it's oh, yeah. fifth. <laughs> oh. Wait. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, friends, and hello, some family. Thank you all for joining us today for the last session of Gallery Week in Kiel's Luminary Program. I'd like to start by welcoming everyone to the fifth edition of Gallery Week in KL that celebrates culture from our city of Kuala Lumpur and now virtually. GWKL is all about collaboration and as a nonprofit program, the Marquis supports art and culture by fostering appreciation, engagement and economy through a variety of exhibitions and programs. This luminary program has been the anchor feature where we have the opportunity to meet and discuss with experts to ask them on their views on topics and developments. So hi everyone, my name is Leanne Loy and I'll be the moderator for today's discussion on young collectors and new collections. On the panel today, I've gathered some of my friends to have a discussion about our personal interests of the arts and how we express them through our collected artworks. I'm hoping to establish a comfortable atmosphere so that we can all engage in an open and curious discussion. So. As it is happy hour, I hope everyone has their drinks, alcoholic or not, at the ready. And with that, I'd like to also say thank you to everyone for being here on this late afternoon. And without further ado, let me introduce our panel for today. So firstly, we have Yo Sin Yi, a partner and head of financial risk management at KPMG and co-founder of Sambilan Art Residency Program. We have Osman Mirzan, CEO of investment company Gilgamesh Capital, and Salima Nazari, a business development liaison at Singaporean art platform and consultancy, The Art Lane. So for those who haven't attended previous GWKL webinars, today's session will be broken down into each panelist's presentations followed by a few questions by me. And once all the presentations are finished, we'll go into a discussion and audience Q and A. So while the panelists and I have a chat, please do submit any questions that you would like for us to address later on in our chat box. Okay, as it's 5.07, I guess we can start. Um, we'll start with Xin Yi who is not only an avid arts enthusiast, but started an arts residency for local artists a few years ago. And so has been an active proponent in the art world in Malaysia. So Sini, I guess I'll pass it on to you. Hey, thanks very much. Thank you, Ian. Um, and uh, thanks to uh, Gallery Weekend KL and the whole team for having this uh, amazing sessions in the, in the last couple of weeks. It's been very interesting for all of us, and I'm very, very honored to be on this panel with uh, Sulaiman and Othman as well, and to be with uh, Lian, who is uh, who has invited us uh, on board. So, um, thank you also for considering me as a new collector. <laughs> so, um, I hope to share some perspectives uh, on um, what it's like uh, for someone who was not really from a the um, art world, I guess, and uh, someone who wants to play a part and also uh, to appreciate art as part of my life and as it has always been uh, since, since I was really young. Right? So I'm just going to share my screen right now. Give me a moment. Can everyone see this? Great. Okay. So, so um, just giving a bit of perspective. Um, I I have fifteen minutes. I will try to make it concise and understandable. <laughs> um, a, a perspective of how I see art is that uh, it's always been around us, uh, whether however old we were and and are. Um, it is a form of documentation. It comes around everywhere as messages, aesthetics, where you're looking at things that you actually enjoy, you like, you observe something. It could be a picture. It could be even uh, something that's up on the mural and something simple, right? As simple as a picture in a magazine, even. Um, it's in nature as well. If you look around, it, it, it's all about perspective balance and how do you look at things. 
uh, the structures that we see is also a form of art. Obviously, architecture is all about that as well. And it's a form of expression. Um, and lately, we see a lot of art being used for uh, to pay tribute as well, right? And it's not just lately, I guess, uh, centuries ago, even when you have sculptures and all that, it pays tribute to people and commemorate things. So art is really all around us. It's not necessarily something that you, you, you buy and put on a wall and then you say that's art. It's, that's not necessarily the case. So you can find it anywhere at any time and you can appreciate it in any way and form that you like, right? I've spoken to many people and they always say, uh, I'm not so familiar with art. Then I, I always think about it as how can that be? Because everything we do touches on it. Um, and everything that we see is a form of this expression, right? So it's something that all of us should be familiar with. Now, how, how things started with me, I guess it never, there was never really a real beginning per se, like you can't really put a milestone there to say, oh, this is when I started to like art. Um, like, like I mentioned, right, if you just look around you and you would appreciate things and you understand, um, you would understand what you like, what you don't like, or you appreciate that a certain documentation, historical documentation carries this form as well, and that's how um, history was documented as well. So I suppose there's no real milestone, but at every point of my life, um, I do, I did resonate with different forms of artistic expressions, well, be it music, uh, be it theater, be it the visual arts, um, even writing. So there was some way that I would engage and participate in that. Uh, by creating or um, just by attending and enjoying and appreciating it, yeah. So um, that that's how it really started. And um, obviously, when you have a life that revolves around, uh, when you experience life that revolves around these, um, I suppose, intangible things, there will come a point where you just want to hold on to something to... Um, I suppose, enjoy and appreciate in your own time, right? And I guess that's where um, a lot of uh, my interest came about. And I would start to look at where would I, uh, what, what would I like, right? And what would I keep? And what would I want to see often that can, you know, um, that can generate my creativity and that can make me think more? Um, it wasn't easy to say that I want to become, an, it wasn't a matter of saying I want to become an art collector. And the moment that uh, really made me uh, like take that plunge, I would say, because uh, the reason why I say it's a plunge is because it was a very big piece of art that just made me go like, wow, I need to have this at home because it just makes me so happy, right? And these were the pieces. Um, I literally just fell in love with these two in the most unexpected time because it was at a di uh, it was at a dinner place and um, they had these paintings that were featured a very clever way of pushing art i think so it was at a dinner place and um when when i saw this it i couldn't help but to laugh and it was i was so happy right um so it, these kind of works really made me uh, feel like, oh, uh, what's the story? What's the reason that they're, 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 we are looking at a father and son with a Pepsi? And it, at that time, uh, as you can see, it was 2010, right? So it was a new painting that was out by this uh, artist. And um, it was uh, about the family in China. So I suppose it has something to do with the fact that it's a modern world and you see the people are you know, huge, right? So they, they are going through a very different time in their lives and in their society. Um, it's a father and son. It's a very typical, very patriarchal kind of society, right? So a lot of messages started to come out of it. And uh, the next piece on the right speed, faster, faster. So it was really funny. And what I really like about this piece is that um, the pig that's being delivered has no clue what's going on and none of us do either, right? But we just assume that he's on his way to the slaughterhouse, to be honest, because that just looks like the setup. So it, it's a little bit comedic as well. And it's a sort of a story that isn't really explicit, but you kind of, you're left to make up that your own story. 
And I think that's just funny. And um, we, when we had this in our homes, uh, in our home, it traveled with us uh, when we were moving countries as well. And every time we had guests in our house, it's always a topic of conversation. And everyone will spend a lot of time just, that is so hilarious. And, you know, we would talk about what the interpretation was. And I think this is what we really enjoyed as well because we were sharing these things and people were like, um, enjoying this piece of work, right? Aside from the fact that it's very well executed, it had a very interesting uh, thought to it, thought process to it. We were very lucky that we were able to meet up with the um, artist. And um, this is even funnier because it gives you, it, exp it gives you the, the, the um, understanding of what goes through an artist's mind, okay? Um, and you know how we interpret this in so many ways. So when we asked the artist, hey, so what exactly were you thinking of? Where is this lorry driver bringing this pig to? And he said, oh, it's really up to you. I just really think that this is a, is a funny way of interpreting the society at that time. And this is what we see on the street. And, um, but it, is really, it really depends on how you want to view it. And it, it is interesting, right? Because there we were guessing and we we're trying to guess what exactly was the, what the artist going was in their minds. But in reality, he's also leaving it up to you to decide, right? And his duty as an artist was, he just wanted to share with you that this is an experience that we saw and we find interesting and I wanted to show it in a comical way. And that's fun. So that was, this is the story of um, uh, Taijun's work that has traveled with us for the last 10 years across three different countries. And I think it has been some inspiration to some of our friends as well, uh, to the art world, because it can be seen as just something very cute, right? And, <laughs> and it's something that, you know, brings joy. Okay, so then when I came back to Malaysia, um, I, I started to uh, see a lot more about Malaysian art. And there were so many very talented artists that, uh, in, uh, in Malaysia. Um, at that time, I guess we didn't see so many overseas, but I, I'm pretty sure that a lot of them are being uh, brought overseas right now, even as we speak, right? So Kairudin's work uh, is, Kairudin is someone that um, I followed very closely from the, from the day that we were back. And this particular piece, this is not my stop, was something that really resonated with me because of the LRT line. And uh, <laughs> it was very local. It is very local. And it, um, aside from the fact that he's really good with his technical skills in uh, charcoal and line drawings, to this day, he continues to develop that skill. I like the local uh, localization of this content and how it is uh, very Malaysian centric, right? And it brings that out. Um, his entire series with this was also um, about people and about observations of the society. Uh, many of them taken on the LRT and uh, this was really special for me. Um, I, I'll just play this very quickly to show you the details because the reason why this was unique is, is, is also because it, it, there are stickers on the per, perspect uh, glass, right? So it's two layers. So the approach is not just about charcoal on um, the canvas. Uh, it's also spray paint. It's also uh, several mediums, right? Okay. Um, oops, sorry. And the next piece I wanted to show us is also a Kairudin piece. Uh, and this is something that... Um, he, he was two years down the road and um, lucky enough to have uh, as, you know, picked this up as well because it shows the growth of uh, Kairudin in the two years from the previous piece that I got. And um, what I really like about this is that the method is different, but his technique is still uh, very similar in line drawings, right? But he's used a totally different medium. And this is uh, the scratch uh, etching on the photo printed aluminium. Um, he spent some time in um, Hong Kong or th and Taiwan, I think. And that's where he picked up uh, learning about some of the characters and how to, um, I suppose, to, to write and to mimic these characters. So it then has that feel of him being taking that experience overseas and making it his own. 
And um, the, the story of this was also really interesting because he was talking about not having regrets. And I, I really like that theme as well. Okay, so this is uh, Karudin's work. Just a little bit of detail for you to see. The precision is really interesting. And what struck me was that um, if you make a mistake, you have to be very skillful to be able, able to fix it, right? So there's practically no room for you to uh, make any mistake unless you are going to start all over again. Okay. Um, there is also this piece by Justin Lim, um, who, who is uh, already mid-career and also very lucky and fortunate to pick this up. Uh, he has done so many solo exhibitions and I think he has something going on right now as well uh, at the uh, RK Fine Arts. But Honey Trap Arcadia was very interesting and it was uh, about, um, uh, uh, it, it was about, uh, it was talking about the complexities and how do you interpret things. And this love nest piece uh, struck me because it looked like something very warm if you just look at the nest and how the eggs are in there. But then there are these stainless steel uh, razor blades that when we, we discussed this and he was saying that, oh, it's very particular. He was very particular about, about materials as well because he wanted to convey the message that well, if you are in a safe environment, but are you really and are the blades there to to uh, protect you or does it pose any harm to you? So certain questions that are being raised and the dichotomy of things uh, really came out in this work and I really liked it. Um, so this is another piece that uh, I'm very proud to, to be you know, to, to be able to enjoy in my own home. Uh, this is something that we got this year. Uh, it's a paperwork and I love it so much because as you can see, it's very vibrant and it just lights up the room. And when you look at it, the precision is really amazing as well. It's built on the basis and concept of the Fibonacci uh, sequence. Um, and it, it just strikes such a, um, how do you say, a, a very happy feel about this, right? Um, so Nabiha has an architecture background and uh, she has decided to go into fine arts uh, full time. And I really respect her for that because with this skill and the ideas that she has and the latest books that she's come up with, it's, I think it's a really great uh, addition to the, to the art, uh, art world. Okay, so there are a whole other host of uh, pieces that I picked up and these are in various sizes, various forms. Uh, some of them are artists who have uh, who have done studies before they produce large pieces, and uh, I like to collect uh, these kind of books as well because studies which are collected uh, kind of gives you an insight into what goes on in their minds before they actually put it on a larger scale, for example, and um, where the studies are really interesting. I really feel that is. Uh, a uh, good way to support that idea as well. So uh, Shabandi and um, Ajim are, are artists that has come through uh, our doors in the residency. But even aside from that and before that, we've already known that they would go very far, right? And these two artists have um, gone on to win awards overseas and uh, local, and they've gone on to do bigger things as well. So really proud of where they've gone. But they've also continued to experiment. And I think that's what's really important for the artists. Um, Ajim has a huge range of um, works that, that, start, that has a background in architecture as well. But he's also combined the very fine works of uh, what a fine art artist does. And uh, right now, he's developing a lot of very new concepts, uh, which also talk about society and um, and um, the world around us, right? So the one on the right is Baba Wong, where uh, he's currently part-time and he's a teacher, but he's experimenting on uh, recycled products. So this is really very current as he, he assesses the issues of sustainability through the themes of fossils. Um, I, I, I'm not sure, I think I'm talking to, I have probably two minutes left, right? So, <laughs> so um, in, in exploring and in uh, this love for arts, like um, a couple of us, three of us actually, we we start we embarked on Semilan Art Residency Program in 2014, 
um, as a passion project, as one of our partners, Lee, would call this, totally correct. Uh, it's a passion project because what we really wanted to do was to bridge uh, the art uh, lovers with the art creators. So artists and people who would uh, consume, right? So who would appreciate art. And we wanted to make art available for all. And that was a very big thing for us. We didn't want to have it in um, very serious locations. So we found places like cafes, we found places and we collaborated with uh, various other platforms so that it was a very comfortable, place for people who are not in the art scene or who are not typical art collectors to join us and to come and speak to artists, to talk to them, to join our community programs and uh, to get to know what it is like to create and to, to appreciate and to understand. So I think we achieved this quite well. We are in, a, in the middle of our pivoting and uh, we're hoping that we can come back with uh, more interesting projects in the future. You can check this up on Instagram and our website. Um, because I continue to explore about art. Uh, these are some of some my favorites, uh, which I was very lucky to go to the uh, Venice Binali to explore. I pulled these two out because it shows the uh, the the more modern approaches into expression and representing what the thought process is, right? So Suki Seok Yong Kang, uh, what I really liked about this is that it touches on history and um, it touches on structure with the thoughts of um, aesthetics in mind and the communication of this was so relatable. Uh, so I really like this piece and the one on the right, um, it would have been better if I could show you the video, but it was about communication and how uh, the timing of words that appear are as crucial as the visuals and how you look at it, right? So uh, this, these are really interesting works as well. Um, and these are my two favorites from the finale. Oh, I do have a video, sorry. <laughs> so uh, if you can see, the, the, uh, these things uh, pop up at different timings. So th this is what I really liked about it, right? Okay. So just a quick uh, a sum up about how I feel and the sentiments about art. Um, it's for everyone, which is one of the reasons why we did Sambilan. Uh, we really wanted to bring it out there. And I must say that we, we have been able to reach out to a lot of people who would not typically walk into a formal setting for art viewing like galleries and art shows. Um, art is sometimes purpose-led. It's about how you relate and how it connects to your environment and to yourself. There is this topic about collecting versus investing. I won't go into too deep into this right now. I think that it might come up in the Q and A's, but uh, just bear in mind that sometimes you, when you collect, you're not necessarily investing. When you're investing, you're not necessarily collecting. So there are two very different concepts. And I've seen people thinking about these two and trying to figure out where they are sitting. And you, know, you just need to um, understand that these two are very different things. Um, it's all about interpretation and we should take it as a personal experience. So if one person might like a piece of work, but it doesn't mean that Lian or Suleiman and Othman, they might like the pieces that I've chosen, right? So they, they would have their own uh, preferences as well. So make it a very personal experience and um, just trust what you like. And as long as you love it, I think that's the most important thing, right? Okay, so I hope I kept into the kept to the time, the end. <laughs> no worries, no worries. That was really great. Thank you so much for that. And actually, what really resonated with me was that um, you mentioned studies, and I always feel that buying smaller pieces is just a great way to enter the art world. You know, even if it's your first piece, you really don't have to buy something major and huge. It just mm. could be a sketch or something preliminary, and. And that led me to want to ask you, was it really intimidating when you entered the art world, like when you bought your first piece? Um, I think it was because um, this was big, right? Before that, um, I, I had like, um, I had purchased smaller items, but it wasn't by, for example, a fine artist. Right. It would be pieces like when I travel or when I see them mm. at a flea market, 
and uh, because it really depends on what you can afford as well. So it, it, it doesn't mean that you're a collector when you buy a big piece. It just means that you, exactly. you like something, right? So you buy mm -hmm. something that you like to see again and again. So it, I only call it as a leap because it was really big, right? I did not have the space to move because I was staying in a small apartment in Singapore. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, that's great. That's really great. Uh, so thank you so much, Nini, for that. And since... And yeah, so I guess we'll move on to Osman Merzan, who is actually like family to me. I've known him all of my life. And he comes from a political family background that has many of its members really interested in the arts. And so they've been collecting for decades from all over the world, galleries and art fairs alike. And that practice is somewhat trickled down to him, I guess. <laughs> and so I'll let Osman talk more about his exposure to the art world. So uh, thank you for having me. First off, thanks to GWKL and, and uh, Ms. Ganendra and everyone for having me and Leanne as well for, for the invite. I appreciate it. Um, so let me share my screen and then I can provide a little bit of context. So first off the bat, as, as mentioned prior, my parents are the, the primary collectors, you could say. So they got me into art, um, me and my sister since we were young by, by basically littering our house with art um, or trying to ask for our, our opinions on which pieces to get for any kind of properties. So um, as you guys can see here, I've got Shepherd Fairy's Obama Hope poster, which is the my latest acquisition. Um, I've been hunting this poster for, God, almost two years now, trying to find a good deal. Um, and as you can imagine, they've, they've been increasing steadily in price. So I, I put this on my first slide because it relates primarily to, to my relationship with art and um, how in the process of starting to build and curate a collection, you find that a lot of it comes down to how you view it and what, what lens through which you view art especially. Um, so I studied political science and macroeconomics as I was growing up, and as a result, a lot of that is carried over in my interest in popular culture and, and politics and understanding, you know, the, the larger elements of how the world works. And there aren't that many people that are more um, influential than the people that end up in power, I guess. So Shepard Ferry, I came across as part of um, my exploration into pop art and, and contemporary art culture. So I first took a look at a Shepherd Ferry piece at Art Basel in 2015, I believe, in Miami. Um, and soon after, I realized that all of his proper paintings were a little bit too expensive for me. So best, uh, best of the alternative is certainly the print. So each of these prints, um, he does through a hand-done hand Oh, I think his screen's frozen for a second. And oh, yeah. Oh, Ahmed, you're, you got frozen for one second. I got frozen for a second? Okay. Yeah. My, my you, connection is unstable, unfortunately. I'm in the jungle. No, no worries. You were talking about <laughs> Shepard Ferry's screen printing process, I think. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. So he does. So typically, he'll start off with um, one painting of the original piece that he wants to do. For the Obama piece, there are actually two. One is with Obama and one is with Shepard Ferry still, the original, original uh, Obama piece. But um, then he transfers it over into screen prints and then does limited runs where he'll sign and, and number each one as they go out, usually between 200 and 300 or so. So as a barrier for entry for young collectors, um, I always found that prints seem to be the most inclusive medium to really go towards artists that are, are somewhat aspirational. You know, if you can't shell out thousands upon thousands of dollars for uh, a proper painting piece, um, getting a limited run print or something that uh, the artist does that particularly speaks to what kind of artwork you're looking at to, to collect, um, tends to work as an incredibly good entry. And, and to be honest, I, I've never really moved away from that entry. I like prints because A, they're cheaper to insure, uh, <laughs> and B, you don't have to worry about whether or not some shipping company is going to scrape off a good top layer. So you can just put it in, in some glass casing and, and leave it at a free port or have it imported accordingly. Um, they also appreciate more uniformly in value over time. So as somebody that runs an investment firm, uh, value is one of the things that I do look at at art. 
So moving on, um, the Obama Hope Post, I'm sure everybody knows, but uh, uh, there's another print that he recently did um, in 2017 to celebrate activism um, across what was at the time uh, quite a transformatory period for women's equality and, and pushes for things like that. So this is a series of three. Um, it's called We the People. And they did approximately, I think it's a 500 first run print and about a 250 second run print for each of them, all numbered and signed. And they split them up. So you weren't able to, to buy them as a, a single piece. Um, so the reason I, I included this in the slide is because there's a little, a little story to go along with my acquisition of the pieces. Um, so the, the, the woman in the hijab that you see on the far left, um, I first came across this piece in the house of a, uh, an, an, an investor in Silicon Valley um, who was a fan of Shepard Ferry and had a few of his original pieces, but he'd, pick, he'd recently picked this up uh, from online. So um, I saw that piece and the next week I went to somebody else's house for dinner and I saw the piece on the right, um, which is a piece about Cuban liberation. So I saw the two and I figured that there would be one more available. And I, I happened to find it on eBay that same night. So I, uh, I made an offer to both sides and, and tried to put the collection together. And, and fortunately, we were able to do so. So on the same theme of primarily political commentary and, and um, people's relationship with power, especially artists' relationships with people in power, um, which is primarily used as an antagonistic kind of relationship. There is this piece that I, I recently picked up called All the Free Speech Money Can Buy. Um, and I found it particularly interesting um, because originally this was supposed to be done as a one-off painting by Shepard Ferry. Um, and it started off as a sketch, but then it, it quickly morphed into, into a print run. So when it became available as a print run, I put a, I put a pre-order in for the post numbering for the first run. I think it was he was doing 350 of these pieces. And I particularly like this because I, was, I had recently bought Edward Snowden's book. So the piece was originally supposed to have Edward Snowden with the, uh, the hand over his mouth. Um, but Shepard Ferry opted to go for, for a slightly more, well, less controversial figure um, so that he could tie it with the brand that he runs, Obey. Um, but knowing the artist's intent and, and, and looking at the larger message that he was trying to convey in the piece itself, I figured that it would be an exemplary addition to uh, what is essentially a teeny tiny collection. Um, so moving on from, from Shepard Ferry, we go on to other artists that people are likely quite familiar with, if this will cooperate with me. No, no, you don't, you don't want to? Okay, one second. I might need some tech support here in a second. <laughs> uh, Do you need me to share? No, I've, I've got it. I'm just trying to figure out how Apple's going to let me move slides across, which they don't. OK, there we go. It's just a push. Um, this one is the final Shepard Ferry piece that I ended up buying called Destruction and Denial. And this one, there, there really isn't a very good story for, for why I added it to the collection. Um, I just saw it, and I thought it was really cool. And there's two of them, basically. So there is a black uh, primary version with red flames. Oh, did you guys lose me for a second there? Perfect. So there's a, a black skull version with red flames and there's a red skull version with white flames. And interestingly enough, when he did the original screen print for it, um, he messed up the first screen print and did it all in black. Oh, this time we did lose him. I really resonate with what he said about prints though. Oh, sorry, Osman, you. I, I, uh -oh. I got cut off. Okay, I'm sorry about that. My internet's been terrible. Um, <laughs> no worries. And it was so, the flames. So I, I figured, well, the original one that he did was black on black, and that didn't have any kind of contrasting elements to it. So he did a secondary run of 250 pieces in the red, um, which I was fortunate enough to be able to, to pick up at the time. Now, these pieces, when they come out, if you're able to get them as soon as they come out, they tend to be quite affordable. You know, in relative terms, we're talking about just under a thousand ringgit or so. Um, but if you pick up just the right ones, because he will usually do, or most of these these kinds of pop culture artists in the U.S. at least, will usually do about, I think he does six to ten runs per year of different prints. If you get the right one from the right year, um, they can appreciate quite quickly in value. So 
it, it all comes down to what the approach for collecting um, for anybody listening here is, is really looking for. If you're looking for something that you want to hold on to and keep forever, of course, just go for any piece that evokes anything inside you. Um, but for somebody like me, who will I, I will usually hold on to it and keep as part of a more permanent collection, maybe about half of all the pieces that I acquire. Um, a piece like this is something that I would be happy to keep for a long period of time and at the same time be happy to offload um, later if the right price and the right appreciation comes along. Now, moving on, um, I have included, so he, he's done murals as well, which you can, I recently found out you can commission. Um, I have not asked for a quote yet though. I feel like that may be a little bit much, um, but Here's Alec Monopoly. So a Alec is a, an artist that's becoming more and more famous in the US. He's recently done collaborations across um, California with the Beverly Hills Hotel with, I think he's doing one with Van soon, um, things like that. So I've known Alec, the artist for, God, seven, six, seven years, something like that. And um, when I first got to know him, he was doing really small pieces. So primarily just drawing on Monopoly cards were his first run of pieces. And slowly he got a lot more um, collectors that wanted to, to pick up on his, on his pieces. So now he does primarily commission only. Um, as you can tell, it's a play on Scarface and the Monopoly man. Um, primarily, it, it's like a cyclical joke on capitalism primarily is the way I see it. The majority of people that push up the, the, the value of his art are people that they themselves aren't serious art people. They like it because it reflects what they see as an opulent lifestyle. Um, but for the people that, that have been buying his art for ages, um, will have known him from before he became the socialite in, in Los Angeles. And as a result, a lot of his earlier pieces, the writing in the background, which I'm, I'm not sure you can see here, are actually mostly anti-capitalist uh, newspaper articles. So things about the 2008 financial crisis, things about uh, Wall Street, you know, screwing over small people, things like that. So in a lot of the houses you'll go to where you'll see pieces of his, it'll be in houses where, where people don't actually understand the art that they're hanging on their walls. But they do give you very, very good value for your money. So I'm not complaining. Um, this is a piece that I, I purchased and sold last year called Rich Airways. Um, so Richie Rich um, over here and Alec Monopoly uh, and Al, uh, Mr. Monopoly, for some reason, the companies behind the characters never ended up reaching out to him to try and demand any kind of royalty. Um, and I think that it's gotten so far that he's just able to use them without any kind of requirement to pay off. So, you know, these pieces eventually, it's more likely that he's going to be unable to continue painting these kind of monikers. So these are the ones that are appreciating primarily in value. Um, I like the piece just because of the color combinations. I, I didn't really buy it as part of a, a need for a permanent collection, just primarily because I knew somebody would eventually want to buy it for some more. Um, and they did. So it worked out. Um, this piece I've held on to since 2017, actually. Um, it's in Silicon Valley. It's a Pablo Escobar piece. He did about four of these. Um, lots of different notorious criminals, basically. He painted them. And, and what I found interesting about it was his approach that he took. So there's quite a few contemporary artists that are coming up in, in LA that primarily use stencil templates to be able to get this kind of accuracy and, and dimension. Um, but his approach, really, all these kind of squiggly lines here, um, they, a lot of the shading and the initial texture comes from, from randomly dropped acrylic dots that he uses the underside of the brush to incorporate. So up here, where it's all primarily, well, completely blacked out, that would have been just free paint that he would then take the bottom end of the brush to kind of intricately bring in more detail. Um, rather than starting off with the basic levels of detail with the eyebrows and the primary facial features, uh, for some reason, he tends to like to take the view that you might as well, you know, just do it as a, a top to bottom piece. So in the development process, he's not actually thinking about layering so much. So that's why I found it particularly interesting that it came out with a level of detail that, um, that provides the kind of shadow and texture that would usually be done later as part of a layering exercise rather than as part of the initial inception of the design itself. 
um, this piece I'm going to hold on to for a long time because he's not he's not doing any more of them. Um, then we move on to an artist that I'm sure a lot of people know here now. I, I'm not really going into the the smaller and indie artists that that I've I've been taking a look at recently. Uh, Murakami. So our hats. Uh, this piece on here. This is this piece is gigantic. It's huge. It's like you can see the panels, um, and I believe it's something like seven feet tall, each of the panels, and about two two and a half feet wide or something like that. Um, and the panels actually continue. There are the, the, the original piece, our hats, um, was a three piecer all in one. And it continues on and basically re repeats, um, but with slight differences between each of the, the different segments. Then he just cut it and started selling off each segment. So I, I didn't manage to purchase this piece, but I organized um, a friend of mine to be able to go and, and pick it up in London. Um, and the reason I really like it is because it, it's, there's a 3D element to it that you can introduce that isn't commonly found in, in these framed and, and canvas pieces um, where you can actually use it as a, a, a room separator, a room divider, if you really want to, um, which is how my, my friend has it presented in his apartment at the moment. Um, but the level of detail, and I think the, the, the imagery itself, which is very reminiscent of old, um, I forget the term, not uh, Japanese demons. Um, it, it's that kind of art style that he it, that he's brought forwards into a more contemporary realm uh, that I find particularly interesting. Murakami tends to get overplayed nowadays, certainly um, because of his because he sells everything under the sun. Um, but I, you know, at, at his core, I still appreciate him as an artist. I, I've included this piece as one that everybody would recognize: Flower Ball, which is his new primary uh, kind of image that he likes to use in a lot of his, his pieces. So these are available as canvas circles, um, as well as in print form. So I have a couple of the flower prints, um, but the canvas pieces themselves are, are so inflated in price at this point that it doesn't seem worth it, really, um, to be honest. So Amazaki Anwar, these pieces are in our house in KL. So Amazaki, I'm sure a lot of people that are listening in know of him as a local artist. Um, we had these commissioned, so the, these are all two and a half feet cube, uh, squares, um, a whole series of them. And these are all different elements and parts of our house here in Malaysia when it was originally designed. Um, so Amadzaki apparently is a fan of the, the architect that did our house, um, Carrie Hill. So when he came in to take a look, he, he wanted to not just paint us as kids, but also wanted to paint the house that we were in. Um, which I found, well, odd, but, but quite interesting. Um, so uh, in amongst all the furniture, God, just stop freaking out, please. <laughs> Sorry, one second. A little, little bit of tech support here. We're, we're getting there. Um, all right, cool. No worries. We're still here with you. Okay. It shouldn't take a second. There we go. Yeah. So... This is actually my bigger brother, uh, Omar. I'm here. I was smart enough to put my, my hand over my eyes for some reason. Um, so, you know, even though it is me, you'll never know that it's me. Um, and there's my sister looking like she's about to cry. But we've had these pieces up for, God, since we got the house, so 13 years or so now. Um, I, think they, I think they are about 13 or 12 years old. Um, and they're oldest, and they've never moved. Um, they've always been in the same place. Um, but I love the level of photorealism that he managed to achieve in these pieces, especially um, in the surrounding on, on, the, on the rock faces here, as well as the contrasting between the, the decking and, and the pieces there. The one thing that I did find particularly interesting was this piece, which I've never managed to see up close, the one in the top left for anybody that can't see my cursor. Um, it is the one piece out of this entire environment that, that does not fit. So. It's the same format, was painted at the same time, um, is, was part of the same commission that, that produced all these pieces. But for the life of me, I can't discern under what context that was included. Um, and I, I've messaged my mom to ask her, but she hasn't replied. So, you know, it remains a mystery through this, through this, um, this discussion as well. 
Uh, and then here I've got Fami Reza included. So I included Fami Reza not because he's an artist that you know sells stuff for collections or anything, but because he's he's he forms I think the clearest element locally of my relationship with art. So how art is an outlet for frustration uh, with the political class, how it's an outlet for um, different understandings of how we perceive governance, uh, power dynamics, and things like that, and also the the ability for art to simply capture the essence and feeling of a time and a period um, in a country or among or in the world itself you know when we all look at this this painting even though he's still walking about um, I don't know I giggle inside and I've always I've always wanted to, to get a big print of that piece put up somebody somewhere that is very very visible um, so you know so there's there's this piece um, this whole collection of pieces which i thought were brilliant you know being able to to put artwork up that you would allow anybody to print out and stick onto a banner to go protest i think that's great you know um and i believe that's all i have um but yeah you know just as a as a round off here for anybody that that's listening in that's looking to to get into collecting um my collection doesn't really have any core themes and I think that everybody that I know that's been getting into art collecting in, in their mid to late 20s and early 30s, um, I, I don't think that they ever, no one ever really starts out with, an, with a clear understanding of my collection needs to fit into this specific category. Yeah, the predominant elements of my collection are, are pop art, but a lot of the, the, the primary goal for any kind of art, art acquisition, at least the way that I see it, is when I look at the piece, do I like it? And would I, would I care? would I want to continue looking at the piece for an X number of years or a period of time? Or am I ever gonna get sick of it? You know, there are some artists that you'll look at a piece and you'll enjoy it for the meaning and, and the artwork that it is, but not an eyesore, but doesn't really evoke the same kind of feeling over and over and over again when you take a look at it. And I hope- well, I think it's- Oh, oh you were saying? No, no, please, no, please. I think it's actually funny that you say that because I do see a general trend in your in your choice of artists is that most of them have a very commercial element to them, which is not to say they're not good or bad, you know, that that doesn't mean much, but it just reminds me of this art newspaper article that I read recently about um, how a lot of young collectors are buying with their ears. So it's basically implying that a lot of buying incentives now derive from hype and, you know, Artists like Takashi Murakami or in Malaysia, um, Fami Reza, these people ha do have a, set of, a sort of like hypey quality about them. I mean, do you yeah. agree? Yeah, no, certainly. I, for, for me, I've always found that it's impossible for me to remove art from culture. Um, and as a result, a lot of the art that I look at is art that speaks of culture. So, you know, while, while I, I will sit down happily and I will appreciate a Rothko or I'll appreciate, you know, and anything that's done with, with pure technical skill and understanding and a specific aesthetic and approach. And I love artists that, that do that where their art is, is, is purely, you know, visual or mm -hmm. representational. Um, I build, I'm building my collection around something that essentially reads as you could you could peel back the years by looking at the pieces, and that's gotcha. what I want to convey out of well, at least the core principles of of, of what I will hold on to as a more permanent collection over time. That's amazing. Thank you so much for for going through all of your works and giving us such great like nostalgic insights into why you buy them, especially the Amazaki piece. I haven't seen that, but it really makes me feel oh, living room. a you great sense of nostalgia. That. Yeah, I will. I will actually yeah. go. Um, okay, since Wonderful. it's 5.53, uh, we'll go on to Salaiman, who actually recently returned from the U.S. after working for Paddle 8, and has since then been looking into Southeast Asian artists to add to his growing collection. Uh, he's actually now working on a commercial business-to-business -business tool for the art lane that aims to transform the way industry professionals source for art. But... I'll let him explain more of that. Levin, go ahead. Thank you. Um, should I go ahead and share my screen right now? Sure. All 
Um, okay. Can you see that? Does that does that work? Okay. So thanks, Leanne, for having me on board, and and Mrs. Kanandra. Um, really happy to be here and, and, and to be a part of this and talk a little bit about uh, my experience collecting and, and what collecting means to me. Um, so as as um, so, I'm just going to zoom through this. I think I've only got 15 minutes, but I'm um, just going to talk a little bit about myself, um, reasons why I collect, what I collect and what I look for, um, things I've collected, and then just briefly touch on age art in the age of, of, of a pandemic. So clearly we all know that, you know, exhibitions are, are different right now and, and we don't really, we can't really go and, and view art the way we do our experience art the way we usually do. So I'm um, just touch on that a little bit um, and then open it to, for Leanne to ask any questions. Um, so, I think similar to, to the other people here, I didn't study art history or, or didn't have an, an art background. I studied philosophy at, at NYU. And then um, funnily enough, I, I was always interested in, in art and the art world and, and the art market and um, read a book about management of art galleries um, in university and came across this company called Paddle 8. So I sent them an email being like really interested in, in what you guys are doing and they asked me to come in and, and, and essentially work for them. So, so I start off with an internship and then end up working with, with Padlet, which is a, uh, a digital, well, was an online auction house um, led by this guy called Alexander Gilks, who, who was um, an auctioneer at, at Philips and, and is a big player in, in the art world. And then earlier this year, um, I moved back and, and joined a company called The Artling, which is an, an online art gallery but also a, um, an art advisory. So what I've been doing for them is I've been helping them work on this B2B tool that helps industry professionals like um, architects and IDs source for artworks in a centralized platform um, and sort of um, centralize the whole process of finding artworks, um, the shipping, the installation, the framing, and just making that whole project management um, part of, of, of finding artworks for, for, for a project easily. Um, so it's cool. It's, um, it's, it's, we're looking to fully launch at, at the start of next year. So stay tuned on that. Um, and what I also do for them is I help them with their street art collection. So if anyone's familiar with Paddle 8, what they, what their forte was or what they sort of focused on was street art. And so um, I'm helping introduce street art with, with the outling and, and we're trying to grow that to, to something a bit more um, exciting looking at looking at um, Southeast Asian art, 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 art in Asia in general um, and the scene there. So um, reasons why I collect, this is just a piece that of an artist that I really like, Mustafa Hulisi. I wish I wish I owned a piece by him, but um, and this is a painting that he did. Um, so these these are this is a breakdown of some of the reasons why I collect art. Um, so the first thing is investment. So um, I look at short and long term, I look at it as short and long term assets, um, support, so cultural and educational support. Um, I think if nobody bought art, there wouldn't be art to, to, to go and see and to go and view. Um, aesthetic pleasure, um, it's nice, it has to be nice to look at. Um, interior design, um, if I need to furnish a space or something like that, I'll, I'll look at art in that, in that context. Um, I buy it because I happen to know about it. It's an industry I've, I've, I've been working in and and um, I suppose if, if you know it's, if someone worked in, in the jewelry industry, they would be buying stones and things like that. So it's something similar. Um, and it's a form of expressing my identity and, and um, my ideologies. So, so it's nice to find things that, that line up with, with how I see the world. And also aid, so like, um, especially in this time, um, I think players in the art world, especially artists and galleries need support. So, it's always good to support it as, you know, from a perspective working in the, the industry, but also in, the, in like the ecosystem in general. Um, hang on, sorry. Okay, so what I collect and what I look for. Um, these are five works that I've collected. And um, I'm gonna go, so I'm gonna go over the five works in a second, but um, generally what I collect and what I look for 
is broken down into two streams. So one of it, so the main stream is obviously personal. So this is more of an emotional um, uh, pursuit. And, and what I focus on is, is outside art. So usually self-taught artists and artists that fall outside of the mainstream um, art history narrative. So um, things that people that are getting recognized later on for the work they've done. Um, and some of the tricks, some of the, the key, key prompts almost that I look at are stuff that triggers my memories and this philosophically engaging and, and falls in line with my philosophical views, um, stylistically playful and, and um, value for money and also educational to a degree. And then um, the other stream is, is for investment. So this is not non-emotional purchases, um, generally tend to be international contemporary just because of, of um, insider knowledge and, and, and knowing people in the space. Um, some street art, um, I look at the market value um, and tends to be lower value stuff. So print, as Osman, as, um, Osman mentioned, prints and editions and works on paper. So how it works is that, you know, usually I buy and flip and this is, this is used to fund um, what I actually like to collect and things I don't like to sell because I don't have enough money to do buying stuff that, that um, I just want to keep. So, um, but part of both of these, there's certain things that, that are essential to me and whether I'm buying for investment or whether I'm buying for personal use, um, I like to look at the gallery program. So it has to be a gallery where I believe in their program and, and how they look to nurture the artist, their vision, um, and what they believe um, their role in the art space is, and then things I avoid. And this is a bit, this might sound a bit funny, but like I, I don't like to, 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 to deal with stuff that that has a negative sort of feel. Um, so things like death, violence, and pain, uh, pain, and these sort of motives, I don't like to invite like bad chi. So I don't, I don't invest in that kind of stuff. Um, and so. Uh, these are five works that I've collected, not this work by Alex Bradley Cohen, I wish, but um, some of the works I've collected. So the first piece I bought was this piece by Beverly Buchanan. And I remember it was in 2017 um, at, the, at one of the satellite fairs to the Armory Show in New York. So I was at the Independent Art Fair, uh, which happened, happened in March, 20, at March every year. Um, this year it didn't go on because of, of um, the COVID, but, but um, back then it was, it's a big fair. So, um, and I remember at the time I was already looking for my first piece and I was thinking that, um, you know, how do you approach, I was reading about how do you approach, like how do you ask for prices, you know, cause it's quite daunting to go to a gallery and, or, or a fair and you, and you know, you see all these pieces and it's, and it's quiet and, and, and the gallerist is just sitting in the corner and um, there are no prices behind, uh, by the paintings and, and um, I read that, you know, you just have to sort of go up and, and ask, you know, and that's, that's just what you got to do. And so I remember seeing someone's sky glasses, his name was Philip, and I asked him, um, if there was some Julian, Julian Martin pieces, um, small pastel drawings that I really liked. So I asked him, um, hey, do you know, how, hey, I'm, I'm interested in these pieces, do you know how much they, they're going for? And he tells me, you know, I'm, I'm not actually part of that gallery. But, um, but she's a friend of mine, so I think they're around, you know, at this price. And we just started talking and he's a really sweet guy. And he was a director of a gallery called Andrew Edlin Gallery, which is in, the, in, in Lower East Side, Soho, New York. And um, this gallery focuses on outside art. So stuff like Beverly Buchanan, um, Thornton Dial. So um, uh, artists that, you know, are self-taught as mentioned and don't really fit in, in the mainstream um, art, art history narrative. So an example of, of, to, of, of what outsider art is, is that, you know, we remember the 50s as pop and Andy Warhol, but parallel to that, there were a lot of other movements that were going on and, and which weren't recognized because of how big people were commenting on, on, on commercialization and, and um, the printing stuff and, and all that, and adverts. So, so um, Beverly Buchanan, so said, and so what, what this gallery did was, Andrew Edlin Gallery and, and Philip, who was the director at the time, he, he, um, he decided to just have works by Beverly Buchanan, which is quite daring for a gallery. Usually they want to showcase their whole um, uh, catalogue of artists, but he just showed Beverly and um, she had recently just died 
um, and he was telling me like all about her, all about her past. And she's this um, queer African American woman from the rural South, and she paints these these houses that reminds her of um, uh, her youth and 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 her community community during during segregation at the time. And um, these they're they're super colorful and they're own pastel and they they have this eerie feel to them. But at the same time, it's like clearly just um, from memory, you know, and, and it's a has a, has a has a nostalgic feel to, to one's to one's childhood childhood and, and youth. So so um, and she also makes these little shacks which are really cool, um, which are just a kind of hand, they look really like rough and raw and and they're really nice. So if you get a chance to check it out. And and he was telling me, Philip was telling me that, you know, there's there's um she's 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 getting a lot of attention right now. So if you're thinking about something, I'd really recommend it. And, and was just talking me through it. And so some of the things that I look at um, so, uh, before buying a piece is, you know, obviously do a lot of research, find out what exhibitions they've had, um, whether there's any institutional recognition, whether they're in, in, any, co in, in any permanent collections, if they've been reviewed by, by press or big magazines. So when I bought it, um, I was so lucky that, I mean, just not lucky, but it happened that right after I bought it, you know, uh, Brooklyn Museum did a retrospective on her. Uh, MoMA bought a piece. Um, the Met acquired a piece, and Whitney. And so it was just like I was very lucky to get to get this piece at that time because it was well priced and and it's and it's doing really well right now. So I, but I don't think I'll ever sell it. So this is a piece that that is not for investment. <laughs> so um, another piece I got got is um is a, is from the Armory show in New York, and I got it. Um, last year, and it's it's by this by this person called Frida Elkazar. Um, so she's a she's represented by this Greek gallery called um, Kalfayan Galleries. It's a smaller gallery, but um, I was just browsing around. And I was thinking at this point, I bought a few pieces, and I was really kind of I had my toes in the art world. I was already working for Padlate for a while, and I was kind of just fed up with the whole investment thing uh, because of, I would just see how people would just buy and sell so quickly, you know, through Paddle 8 and, and things like that. So I kind of just went in there just like wanting to get something that I just really like and not caring about who it was. So um, I came across this piece, which was which really caught my eye and I kept coming back, I kept coming back and it was still that same piece that caught my eye. And it's, um, and she paints these, she's not, not, no one famous or anything, but she paints these, these um, these houses that are just like isolated around. So, so this, for example, is isolated but in in gold leaf, and just memories of of what her upbringing was like in Alexandria, in Egypt. Um, so she's moved to she's in, she lives in Athens now. But these this sort of triggered memories of 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 when I would travel to to like um, Damascus in Syria as a little kid, or just parts of the Middle East, and it's just. Um, uh, how it's just an isolated building in this, in this you know, really pastel between night and day, um, dreamy like tones. It just reminds me of like, that's clearly like a past memory. So I, I really like this piece and, and it's, just, it's special to me. Um, and then there's stuff where um, I bought for, for investment, but I also quite like. Um, so this is a piece by Alex Gardner. Who's with the whole? Who, who's who's um, um, an artist with with the whole gallery in New York, and he paints these black um, uh, anamorphic figures and and um, um, in, in serious detail, um, um, and they're faceless and and it's almost like um, uh, and they, they look like they're in motion, you know, and they're huge. And um, so uh, I just thought they were really cool. Not not much to say about it, but just a commentary on like. Uh, I don't want to sound like an art historian or like a, a pretentious art critic, but but they're just they're really cool and and just invokes a lot of thoughts about what it's like to be African American in in um, in this day and age, you know, like what it's like to be in that kind of body and and um, and so these are things that that I thought was cool. So um, again, how 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 it happened, how I ended up getting this piece was. I was at the hall for work and there's a street artist called Maya Hayuk and she was doing this print release. So I'd gone and I actually, I got a piece by Maya Hayuk and the gallerist was talking to me and we were just chatting and she was telling me that they're, they're, they're doing this release of, a, of prints by Alex Gardner. Like if you want, like I could get you on top of the wait list. And I was like, okay, cool. You know, and um, um, let's do it. So 
I ended up getting a piece and, and uh, I'm really happy with it. Um, so this is something cool. Um, and this is something I bought this year. It's a piece by um, Sophie Van Hellerman, who's a blue chip artist. And she was with Saatchi and she's with some big, big galleries now. Um, and uh, I bought it. So this is, um, she did this release with counter edition. So it's a kind of a semi print um, where, she, where the, the, it's printed, but at the same time, she's, she's done watercolor over it. So um, she's, she's kind of mixed the two and it, it gives that unique feel. So as, as Othman mentioned, like prints are a bit more of an entry level, um, uh, like a lower barrier, barrier to entry to get into the art world if you're looking for works. And, and, and sometimes you get really good deals um, with prints. So I thought this was a, a, cool, a cool piece. It was unique. Um, and it was well priced. And also on top of that, she donated all the proceeds to a food bank in London. So um, just to raise funds during during this COVID period and, and during the height of COVID. So um, I managed. Um, I'm, I'm a member of that of of, of counter edition. So I managed managed to get this piece early. Um, so so it's something I like to actually at the back there. You can't really see it. Um, and finally, this piece by Faith Ringgold. Um, she's another outsider artist. She's, she is pretty big, but I remember seeing her in, in, in the Armory show a few, the first time I went, when I got the Beverly Buchanan. And um, this is something that, so it's, I was looking for a piece for the music room, so I really like listening to vinyl and jazz and um, came across this piece when I was, when I was in, in um, visiting Serpentine Galleries in London. And it was a print and I thought, why not? She's doing well right now. So um, sometimes it's just a bit about what you know and, and your knowledge of like what's, how an artist is, how, how an artist is to be projected in the future. And, and so, yeah, so it's hard to say that like, you don't think about investment value. You don't think about long-term um, uh, returns. So, so, um, but at the same time, you do have to like it. So this is something I ended up getting um, this year. And finally, I'd just like to touch briefly on, on collecting art in the age of a pandemic. So um, for those of you who are looking to collect, obviously it's a very different time. Um, so some of the things that, that I've noticed and read is, is, is that, that um, there's been a growth in lower value contemporary art. So while the art market is hit, um, people are still really interested in lower value contemporary art. And you can see this with sales in Sotheby's and Christie's and, and, and the secondary art market, and also with galleries in, in, in New York and, and in London. Um, I'm not too fam familiar about the Asian art market yet, and it's something I really want to get into being back here. Um, but I can only speak on that. And obviously, um, online platforms and e-commerce channels. So these are doing well. If you haven't checked out the art link, check it out. Um, obviously, there's artsy that's that's um doing well for, for 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 now taking the space of paddly and doing these online auctions and things like that um and then you've got online exhibitions out there so one big thing if you're interested in collecting it's it's so important to just go and see and just keep looking at art and keep visiting spaces i know that this is it's different right now and things are online but things are online but you can also you still visit it online even though it's different keep keep checking it out because um, that's how you're going to train your train knowing about whether whether this is a good work by an artist or bad work by an artist and just recognize what what you like ultimately so keep visiting galleries and things like that and, and even online um, exhibitions so another thing that that's that I think I've picked up that I picked up on is that because we're not allowed to travel so much right now um, support local like um, I'm sure your communities really could do with some support and financial support. So um, if you see something and you can afford it and you like it, um, get it because you won't regret it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so that goes on to my next point, artist aid and industry support. And um, I was speaking to Philip again the other day, just just um, getting in touch with him because um, and, and just seeing his thoughts about how the art market is doing in New York and, and the space he's in. and um, He's, he told me that there's a serious inflation in queer feminist and African-American art. So be aware that certain times will lead to, to a 
crazy hiking practice for a certain, certain genre of art and just be aware and uh, if, if this is an inflation or if this is like um really how it's how it's how it's spiking so um don't just get on the bandwagon really do your research think about it um i think the spike is because there's so much political unrest in america and so much um hate crime and all that so so that that's why there's a spike but but don't pay too much for something you know um also charity auctions is you get great deals there so a you know you're supporting um uh, you're creating social impact and then B um, you can get really good deals on stuff. So stay tuned on, on what's, what's coming out in charity auctions. And then finally just read out market reports, publications, reviews, and just stay tuned um, on what's available. Um, that's, that's what, what, what I have to say about collecting out in this time. Thank you. Osman's coughing for you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. And Firstly, I love your Alex Gardner piece. It's beautiful. Thank you. And I also really I appreciate you. the fact that <laughs> that you mentioned outsider art because it really does highlight the fact that other movements are happening in parallel to those that are in the mainstream. And that doesn't make it any lesser art to purchase or to add to your collection or put in your house. And so I think that's important. Um, and another important thing that I was reminded about is that um, please do drop in any of your questions for us to address. I will be asking our panelists a few questions right now, but this is to, you know, uh, for the audience to just drop in anything you're curious about and would like to ask, ask each person. They can be specific or just general questions. Um, and so with that, I think I'll go on to the Q&A session where I'll ask our panelists a few questions. And I think it, it all really pertains to one another just because I feel like all of you have um, incidental connections between your works and how you see uh, the values of artworks. And one of that has been um, the urban factor of art and the fact that, you know, art uh, art should be approachable to many different people. And so with that, I've always just wondered how not, not only do you curate your own collection, but how do you see your art collection evolving in the next 10 years? And I'd say I, I'd like to start with Zingyi with that question. How do I see uh, my art collection evolving? Um, I think I actually don't know yet because I, <laughs> and the reason why is because uh, when I look at um, the art books that I like, um, I find that it's very, very much related to who I am at that point and um, what's important for me, right? So for example, in the past when I have less knowledge on um, artists or the concept of what a story lies behind it or even techniques, then the things that I look out for is different. But the more I see and the more I explore and experience, what I notice is that my understanding of what I like also changes. So for example, um, when when we were uh, when I was overseas, like my concept of art was very broad because there were all sorts of things that were available out there and methods and uh, narratives. And when I came home, like um, a lot of uh, the Malaysian narrative is about our environment, our social uh, situation. And then you, you adapt as well because you kind of realize that, you know, this is the narrative of Malaysian artists and we talk about how our environment is changing. And then you look at the, the things that are being used. It's also about what's accessible and how their ideas have changed over the years because of what they are going through. So I think it really depends on where I am and um, what is that... Um, what is the story of the time? For me, I like to collect things which tell uh, of where, where I am and 
um, that period that I am. It's a form of a documentation for me. So that's why when you look at the things that I've collected, there are bits and pieces of very different things, but they are all uh, telling a story of what is, um, I suppose, what's happening then, right? And what the right. artist is experiencing at that point. But one thing for sure, um, I definitely like to look at um, mediums which are uh, different, Right. So what I realized is that I started to move away from things like uh, canvas drawings and canvas uh, mm -hmm. paintings. Uh, I used to like it. And then after a while, I was like, OK, maybe we should look at something else. Right. So then I looked at combinations of things. And then the new media is actually something that I'm really, really curious about uh, because great. there's a whole totally different way of presenting and executing and the technique is also different but the foundations of the conventional are still to be there so um, I also look at that yeah that's really interesting because when I worked in the gallery as well we, all, we, we would show new media art but because a gallery also has their commercial responsibilities to market the artworks it was there was always a almost like a doubt as to how to sell these works of art and how to keep them or preserve them just because they're so ephemeral, you know? Um, and, and I think, but that's a great way to, you know, stay with the time and stay relevant because it's a great practice that people are really starting to dive into, you know, video work or projections or, you know, installations. So I think that's really great. And I, I agree that, you know, when you keep, when you keep up with the times, um, you tend to grow with the artwork or artworks that are, you know, being produced at the moment. But on the contrary, I know a lot of people who follow the artists and maintain relationships. And um, Osman, you mentioned that your one of your friends is Alec Monopoly. And I remember you told me about him when you were in London during college. And I was so intrigued because I was like, wow, this is, you know, this guy seems like such a big artist. I wonder how that's going. And do you think that he's informed any of your buying choices when it comes to like urban art, street art? I, I can't treat, like I've never treated his art as if it was collectible, I guess. I, I, the only piece that I really hold on to is that Escobar piece because I asked him to, to paint it. Um, <laughs> but the, he's, for for me, Alec is an artist that got basically swept up by the mainstream and plays a role. So he's been my enabler to buy pieces that I really like by selling his pieces. Uh, so, That's yeah. so funny. Yeah. But yeah, yeah it actually like, is really funny. Yeah. And also that, that goes back to investing in art, right? And how we sometimes make decisions to buy art because it's a stepping stone to buy some other pieces of art. I've done the same myself. I bought like, instead of buying a big painting, I'll just buy a little little print, you know, so I can work my way up to a larger piece. And it's usually of a really big artist, which is something that Suleiman's done as well. You know, you buy a print just so you might one day be able to get a big painting. And so I really, I, I resonate with that. Oh, I, actually, I have a really good question for Salaiman. You mentioned that a lot of galleries and exhibitions are shifting online. And I was just wondering what your thoughts about, uh, are about that. You know, do you think that these online exhibition formats are actually capturing the essence of these artworks? Do you think they're doing any good at all to the industry? Um, okay, so I guess... I guess a short answer, it'll never be the same, you know? It'll never be the same. Um, seeing something online, um, seeing, seeing an exhibition, no matter how well it's done, there's no way uh, you'll get the same feel or same connection with an artwork. Or at the same time, and, but, and with that, I think people who are buying stuff online, it's, it's with artists they're already familiar with and um, a story they already know. So it's more about acquisition and and um, owning something that they're really familiar with. Um, but when it comes to seeing a show or seeing um, an exhibition where you've never seen the artist before, no, no relationship to the work, to the gallery, it's very hard, I think, to, to appreciate it. Yeah. 
Susan, you seem like she really agreed. A keen on answering. Do you do you have an answer or a, an a, an idea of how I, I it's changing the meaning? I resonate with what Suleiman has shared because I think the emotional factor or rather um, the feeling you get when you actually look at a really good work is very different when you see it up front and um, it is also a function of the space that it's at and a well curated show uh, can really give you a very different uh, experience. Right, so okay. I've experienced that many times, and that's why I keep going back to to exhibitions, to shows, and I really love it because there's something different about being in a room with a very interesting piece of work that you can resonate with, um, and that you can connect with. Right, when I look at exhibitions online, um, I feel that um, yes, it's nice or it's not nice. But mm. that's all I feel, you know. I, I don't go like, wow, that speaks with me. <laughs> so I can't get that kind of interaction. I don't know if it makes sense, but it feels too um, detached. So I, I really right. can't wait for uh, the chance to go back out and um, yeah, experience the physical space uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. when you go to shows. Yeah. I do, I do yeah. want to say something else on the point, and it's that one thing positive about, about online exhibitions is that for a lot of us who's, who's never, who feels like, you know, art, art has this almost sacred quality. Exhibitions have, have, this, have this aura <laughs> for people who aren't so mm -hmm. familiar with, with collecting or, or, or viewing art. So um, I think that for, for, the, for these segment of people, it allows that, that, um, that freedom in viewing works, you know, without being criticized, right. without being judged, mm -hmm. with, feeling from like you're looking at it from your own home you know and and this is what like Instagram has does done for example so maybe for younger generations um it really does serve a function and they can have mm -hmm. that connection that uh maybe some maybe the older generation will not and so um yeah. we'll just have to see how it changes because it is the reality and that and that we will have to look at a lot of art online now yeah no I agree I mean a lot of artists are selling their work on Instagram and and art laying and art fee and platforms like that, which is really changing the whole industry in it in a pretty great way for that they're almost democratizing art, which is amazing. Um, but one of the roles that Singi mentioned and also Osma mentioned earlier on is this idea of curating and maybe the role of the curator. And one and um, somewhat jo Josian Regain asked. Well, thank you for all the inspiring presentations. But as collectors, what are your feelings about art curators? Do you refer to them to get their opinion about artwork or do you simply ignore them? What role do you think they play in the art ecosystem? And Ofman, do you have any? Yeah, I, I think it, it's context. So like speaking about what, what Suleiman was mentioning earlier about online stuff, I think the online world for purchasing and viewing art works really well for 2D and for prints. Outside of that, it, it becomes very difficult. The easiest example I can think of is um, C.Y. Twombly. So C.Y. Twombly, for the people that are listening that don't know, his, his pieces, if you were to take a picture of it and look at it, it looks like a four-year-old did it. Um, but what you're missing is the context and the scale, the environment. Mm -hmm. So he has a permanent collection at the, uh, I believe it's the Fine Art Museum of Berlin. Um, and these pieces are huge. They're like 10 feet tall, you know, 12 feet tall, two stories, gigantic pieces where you basically just doodled um, over a gigantic canvas, some crazy, I don't know, semi-psychedelic stuff. Um, but I, I love it. Like I, I love C.Y. Twombly as an artist, but I would say if the first time that I ever viewed one of his pieces was online without any context and especially without any curation, I probably wouldn't, you know, give it a second look. So, right. you know, much like the way that we as collectors are, are putting together pieces that may fall under a category that we think will get value or may fall under a category of things that we specifically like, um, there will always be a theme, be it, you know, the kind of aesthetic that you like, the kind of medium that you like to look at or collect, the kind of thing that you like to display. 
um, or in, you know, closer to, to the way that I approached it, the curation of things like things that have to do with events or things that have to do with specific moments of time that are captured in its essence as part of a piece of art. Um, and I think that that's where curators are, are particularly important is not so much in, in sure, how you present it is, is important, but also the order in which and the, the, the space in which you view and understand why the art is the way it is, is particular. Yeah, context. Yeah. Right. I agree. I mean, my, my dabbling in curating has also taught me that sometimes the artworks can't speak for themselves and you really do need to create some kind of framework to, you know, uh, put these pieces into context or, you know, create a narrative around it. But um, another question that came to mind by Jia Tio is, uh, well, this is specifically to Sinyi, but also it is open to everyone else. It's given how the industry awareness is sparse in Malaysia, what do you think we can do here in this country to spread awareness and perhaps reduce the stigma of art collecting as an upper class hobby? Are there any difficulties that Sundilan art faced that you'd like to share? Oh, um, yeah. So when we started Sundilan, I think this was one of the one of the main things that we noticed and we wanted to address. That's why uh, Sundilan was so crucial and the model that we built around our channel of exhibition was uh, largely also to address this. So we noticed that there are the creators and artists, right? So there's the artist, there are plenty of very talented artists, but we also noted that um, whenever we go for shows, it's always the same group of people we see. <laughs> so, I can attest to that. <laughs> yeah. And um, after a while, then uh, the few of us were like, why is it that? And we also noticed that um, even amongst the people we know, uh, and we uh, among three people, I think we do know, we, we, we were brought up in Malaysia, right? So, but we didn't know many people who were interested or remotely interested to even try, right? To just have a look and walk in and then um, there were there are obviously a few reasons that I think that is why it is why it is in Malaysia education is one I once spoke to the, the organizer for affordable art fair in Singapore and she pointed out to me that um, art is seen as um, bare necessity and it's almost like the food they eat in um, Italy or France and Europe right kids know and kids know who are they are, um, the artists locally who have given so much yeah. to the country and all that. And, and they, they become, you know, the prominent people. So they know. But in Malaysia, art is not really seen as, a, you know, part of us, our identity, right? It's not obvious. We were not brought up in that kind of environment. Mm. So it's not natural and it's not in uh, it's not second in nature for us to feel like we want to explore and see you know go to a gallery or a museum even so when we created some bilan yes it was because we wanted to address and bridge that gap and we wanted to bring art to everyone uh, and to let everybody appreciate what they can do we we started off with the big band we were very lucky uh, that um Alliance Francais at that time gave us their halls and over three to four weekends and even extended, actually it was two weekends and extended another two weekends. This was in 2014. And we made the most out of the space by having um, a lot of programs for uh, families, for children, for adults and education, uh, to host educational talks and all that and to generate the hype and the understanding of who are these artists and what is Sembilan? And we, we had things like go local and, you know, um, I remember it's not about the money, you know, that kind of taglines. Yeah, so that yeah. it generates the kind of interest um, for different uh, category and different groups of people. Um, and after five seasons, I think what we had was we had over 10 or 15 exhibitions all held in very different places from cafes to bars um, to other uh, markets and uh, we, there were so many different types of exhibitions that we had 
and we had very different groups of people coming to a certain extent that some of um, the other collectors actually told us you guys have very different groups of people coming to the launches and the mm. exhibition for the artists because um, of the venue I guess and um, by virtue of like our the brand the Sembilan brand right by the time we had the uh, most recent one in 2018, unfortunately, we had to stop for a short while. But uh, in 2018, our turnout was really good. And you could see the breadth of people come, the, the, the different types of people coming to the exhibition and the coverage of um, uh, exposure that we got. We have very good friends in the media who was putting it out there for us as well on different channels. So we put ourselves on things like makes BFM hits, right. um, even the, the more uh, popular and younger generation kind of uh, mm -hmm. media outlets as well. So that, you know, you get a different group of people coming um, mm -hmm. and community outreach programs. We, we reached out, we had like, we had our mini auctions through our other community projects with uh, SMA, you know, it's the, mm. um, uh, another group uh, on disability. And we reached out in very different channels. So I think the main thing was to generate interest for different communities. And I think it worked. I only hope that we can continue further. So uh, we are still planning on what's next, yeah. But that was definitely one of the things that we are trying to encourage. And um, in, in Malaysia, I think that's what many of the uh, people in the art world should try to do as well. I agree. I think education is such an important component. Um, if, you, if you go anywhere in Europe, um, art history is a core subject in, in their education. So when they grow up, they know a handful of artists, right, like you said, that contributed to uh, national culture and you know made an impact in the in, in international sphere um, and and so you mentioned uh, collaborations with different types of industries and question for Salaiman do you actually see um, potential collaborations within the industry between maybe say Art Lang and Sabilan Art or you know event spaces like the Go Down toward a shared goal in educating Gen Y and Z on art collecting? Um, yeah, definitely, definitely. I think I would like for that to happen, you know, um, because I think it's just access at the end of the day, just having initiatives to help people um, see what's going on and see what's available. I think people always complain. Um, I'm sure you can speak on this more, um, Zinni, but people always complain that there's such a small art scene in Malaysia, like, there are no, there's, there are no galleries or like there's nothing. It's such, it's so infant. But there is actually a lot of stuff going on, and I think that um, a collaboration with a, a larger platform, um, something like the Artling or, or Artsy, where you know you've got the infrastructure for an e-commerce space to, to to bring this to light uh, with something like Similan Arts, I think that's something that could be great for for mm -hmm. for growing the the cultural awareness um, of art in. Southeast Asia for that matter, yeah. That is actually, yeah, I mean, on, I mean, it's uh, having these online components are actually helping to grow education amongst the youngsters who just like, you know, Google everything, which is really amazing. I mean, I'm young, I mean, we're all young here, but you know, I'm just saying. Um, a question for all panelists. Which art, Malaysian artist do you feel is, inter is doing interesting work and would recommend us to follow? Because we're all, we're all, you know, very internationally exposed, but I think that it is important to like Sulaiman and, and Cindy and Osman as well said, uh, support local. Is there one artist that you can think off the top of your head that you can just tell people to follow? Oh, you're muted. A, a Malaysian artist? Yes. Oh, you're putting me on the spot right now. You're putting me on the well, spot right now. I can tell you one Malaysian artist that I'm currently following who is just growing a great fan base in Asia in general. And they're called Pangwak Sulap. 
they're a print collective from Sabah and there's just around like 15 members and what they do is you know they make these huge gigantic pr woodblock prints that they um, dance on to print after they've rolled ink on it and what comes out of it is these amazing collaborations between 15 members and they're always commenting on political issues all around Malaysia so I have one of their snake and ladder pieces and you know it the, the game is the game of all these um political scandals that have arise, arisen in the past five years so that's that's a collective that I've been following recently and for everyone who's listening Pang Rock School Up are a great collective there's there's a diorama artist I've been following, um, Eddie, Eddie Putera, Putra. Um, have, you, have you guys ever heard of him? Does these incredible, super detailed, tiny dioramas of local neighborhoods. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. It's like if you shrunk Chow Kit down to fit on your desk. That's what his art. Oh my days. Oh, sorry, he's stuck again. <laughs> That's a nice freeze pose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this mistake. Was I frozen? For, for me, I think <laughs> Was I frozen? Yeah, your freeze pose. Ooh, love it. Yeah, yeah. Eddie, Eddie Putera, I've been following him for the past couple of months, um, trying to find more pictures of his art and, and the context under which he, he makes it. Very much in the introductory phase to getting to know the artist at this point, but... Um, God, they, they look super cool. They're like these teeny tiny neighborhood dioramas where it's like if you, you shrunk whole neighborhoods down into 30 centimeter blocks. Beautiful. That's awesome. I've, I've not heard of him, but there are so many Malaysian artists that really make an impact that, like we said, maybe they could be outsider artists that we don't really hear about. And no, we don't have a chance to hear about them, which is sad. Um, another question. Uh, for the speakers is, how do you feel about your role in the art world as collectors? How can the consumption of art be more democratic within a saturated and corrupt market? Well, I'm not sure what corrupt is implying. I'd say, okay, so I'd say 50% of all of the art I buy, I sell. Um, so from a value perspective, you know, unless the art market suddenly wants to never appreciate, you will always need rich people without taste at the end of the day. Going back or, to Alec. Yeah, that, that's, that's really what, what it comes down to is like, even with the, the Shepherd Fairy pieces and the Murakami pieces and stuff like that, you know, he's only really, they've only really exploded in value due to the, the ease of access and recognizability of his pieces caused mm -hmm. by both you know more people viewing his pieces on social media as well as more people willing to buy pieces you know immediately without looking for a better deal without looking for a good gallery relationship and that in itself is what helps these pieces appreciate in value over time so yeah 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 i mean collectors are yeah i mean collectors are patrons of the art world and you know, it, just because you you make art available to everyone doesn't mean that everyone is privileged enough to buy it. But the few that do really do help to circulate works throughout the community, society, and even sometimes further on, you know, from Malaysians living abroad who bring Malaysian artists out there. Um, it really does ease the pressure off Malaysian galleries who don't have the reach internationally, I feel. Um, and another question, I guess, and perhaps maybe a second last question is, what roles do galleries play for collectors and investors in the near future, given the multi-platform ha platforms housing many artists? Oh, it's a, it's a gallery question. Good question. For, yeah, it's a good question. Maybe Sulaiman, can you touch on that? Sure, I think I think you'll have a good perspective as well, being with A plus and things like that. But I can just say briefly that um, so in terms of identifying um, the career trajectory of an artist, um, they're almost like 
uh, steps and tiers in galleries. So you've got the blue chip galleries and these are the highest um, uh, uh, level of a gallery there is. Like it's almost like the, the museum level of a gallery. So something would be like Saatchi Gallery or Gagosian. And then you've got mm -hmm. a mid range um, and these are like feeder galleries that, that where artists can almost go up to the next tier. And then a, a lower range where um, certain galleries, if you identify them, have um, artists that tend to get picked up by, by bigger galleries. So something like Beery Goldberg or, or um, will lead on to somewhere with Anton Curran, which is a big gallery in New York. And then from there, they'll go into Gagosian, for example. So yeah. um, identifying these channels will allow you to, to, note, to, to make note of galleries that have really good programs and are really know how to push the right artists. So in, if you're looking in terms of investment, identify these, these trajectories and these almost a step ladder of galleries that exist. I absolutely agree. I always call them gallery, um, A, B, and C galleries, which Im doesn't imply that one is better than the other, but they do have different roles in the industry and they are still significant, even though you have online iterations of these galleries. Like we've said, online exhibitions themselves do not always pre present work in the appropriate context or in the appropriate forms that you can appreciate them in, unless you know they're prints and meant to be on screen, um, which is important to note as well, I think, especially for now. Um, and I'm also quite wary of time. We have 15 minutes. Um, so maybe we'll just do one more question and see how that ends. Um, how do you see the current art Oh, sorry. How do you see the current art scene in Malaysia and how can we make it better or elevate it? It's a big question. Sineen, do you have an idea of how we can elevate it? Wow, that is a big question. Um, <laughs> so uh, earlier on, we talked about um, education awareness and I think uh, it's all. I think that in Malaysia things are uh, opening up. Uh, there are a lot of initiatives. I feel that from a public perspective, uh, Balai Seni has been very much a lot more active uh, in the last couple of years, and they have engaged. Uh, they have reached out and they've run a lot of new programs for various groups of artists and um, of course different. Um, I suppose genres as well. So I think that has helped, uh, but it still goes back down to education, right? So for example, um, with my kids, like then I would, I would also want them to be able to expose themselves to uh, what is our, what are our national um, art heroes? Who are they? You know, and how does that affect us? Things like that. Um, but aside from that, I guess in everybody um, either subconsciously or consciously, you know, just keep your minds open um, and appreciate the fact that art does play a role in every aspect of our lives. Like when, when we saw the uh, survey that was being done in Singapore about where oh. does art, the importance of art, that was so painful because it makes you realize how ignorant people are, right? Uh, but things like that just gives you an idea about um, the perception people have. And I think that has to change, right? So, yeah, I yeah. so I, I, what, what can we do to elevate? Everybody needs to be more open-minded. Is that idealistic? And <laughs> it's a very big question. It's very hard to answer, yeah, to be honest. No, it is. I think that can open a whole new conversation if I, on if i can just tag on to that actually mm -hmm. i think something really interesting to note is you know when you're when you're in europe and when you're in america and where you're in kind of developed markets you notice that there's community art the 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 the, the neighborhoods the cities the people that are in charge when you're planning new areas new parks new locations there is an, a concerted effort to include community art Right. If it's either a representation of national pride, like you would get in the Washington Sculpture Gardens, 
or say, for example, how integrated Gaudi is into the city of Barcelona and, yeah. and pretty much how you can't really walk around without being exposed to art in some way. Mexico City has a, a, an absolutely brilliant park where there's just all these gallery level sculptures just dotted around, lying around. You can eat and, and walk amongst them. The one thing I've noticed since I got back to Malaysia was you don't, you're not, you're not contextualized into the art when you're here. You have to go find it. Yes. Yeah, I think that is a problem as well. In New York, I mean, we have the New York Art Fund that pops up, you know, uh, works in, in the financial district or like, you know, Rockefeller always has work up in their, their garden. And it makes, you, it makes you intrigued because they are available and accessible. Whereas, like you said, in Malaysia, you have to really make a considered effort to go find art, which is so irritating sometimes. Um, but on a brighter add, note, oh sorry. yeah, go ahead. I do want to add briefly on that note, and it doesn't fully tackle the point, but it's just something I want to say for everyone. And it's that like um, stuff like public art installation, art, it's going to be a bigger thing now in the, in, while, while, while people can't really be indoors in a gallery. So, um, and in some ways, like you mentioned, the New York Public Art Fund and, and installations like this, it's a form of street art. It's on the street and it's publicly viewable. Right. So I want, I, I want, I think people need to rethink or, or we should rethink um, what we think of as street art and not as a aesthetic visual thing of being graffiti inspired mm -hmm. and um, anti-establishment or anything like that. But um, something that we can publicly see and something people are tagging for everyone to see like outside of a gallery space, outside of the commercialization of, of, of a gallery. So um, in, on that note, let's pay more attention to the street art that exists in Malaysia and consider that as public art, as um, a New York public fund, as you mentioned. Um, so things like that, I think we should think about. That, that's yeah, really, that's really very true because um, when we see in the last one year or so, you do see a lot more of um, murals, for example, that's to be specific, right? Like in KL, um, in the other more um, hip areas like Ipoh, Penang, you know, and everywhere it, in uh, Klang Valley, there are, uh, there are a lot more um, very beautiful murals. You have Kenji Chai doing a really awesome job um, and uh, many other mural artists, right? And I think there is a growing appreciation for that, uh, less, destruction of it and less removal of it, um, the authorities actually start to leave it there, right? But they start to understand, you see, so, the, so everybody does play a role. Uh, you have a couple of destructors, right? But they are more politically driven than anything else. But otherwise, um, that's where the public actually takes a, a role in saying that and voicing out that hey yeah this is so beautiful and the fact that when we appreciate it even taking instagram pictures and posting it all over the all over the net shows appreciation shows that it has it's something that the public wants right so i think these are the little things that um we need to be proactive as well we need to go out there and enjoy it just because you see it on the Instagram, you're just sitting at home and then you know you don't go out and support the fact that it's there. That's also that doesn't mean anything, right? You're just right. another keyboard warrior. So Yeah. We need more active and less passive participation. And yeah. I agree with that. And and on that note, um, I'm just uh wanna, wanting to um wrap today's session by saying um Thank you all for, for such like positivity and encouragement in making, you know, art more um, informative and, and giving people a perspective of art that is not so um, exclusive and for coming into uh, this discussion with an angle that um, art should be accessible to everyone. And it doesn't really matter where you start, whether it's outsider art or Takashi Murakami, um, it's all still valuable and valuable to you in some way, somehow. So um, I just wanna thank all of the panelists that are here today and the audience that are still listening um, and Gallery, Gallery Week and Kale for 
allowing us to have this insightful conversation on collecting. And I also hope that some of what we said really resonates with everyone and encourages you all to start collecting your own artworks or starting your own collections. Um, and before we close, I'd like to introduce Shalini Ganandra, the founder of GWKL, to just say a few words. Um, hello, thank you so much, Leanne, and thank you to our super panelists, um, Sulaiman Othman and Z, because what we really heard was your story, and that, I think, is what art is about. It's about the narrative, it's about telling a story, the artist tells a story about a place, a time, a subject of interest, and collecting is about a story, and appreciating is about a story, and we've heard three different very distinctive stories, very different aesthetics, and um, a wonderful rationale that's not always commercial, which is kind of heartening to hear. And I think that in terms of just accessibility, it's really about appreciating everything is, that is around us. Malaysia has so much to offer in terms of architecture, in terms of heritage, in terms of conversations and dynamics. This is all informing our collective conscience on art and creativity. So we shouldn't, I, I think we should really celebrate what we have here and enjoy it and try to revive and resonate with it. And that's one of the reasons and objectives of Gallery Week in Kuala Lumpur. And we thank you so much for bringing that message across to our wonderful audience with all the lovely questions. And we look forward to seeing what you do in future and having your collections featured and discussed and shown at the great museums in the world. So um, thank you all and uh, look forward to seeing you again next year. Gallery Weekend Kuala Lumpur. Thank you, everyone. Thank you Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye. Bye.